What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. And today we have a very special guest and that is my 1978 Kawasaki KE100. This is a really, really cool little bike and I'm gonna do a quick little walk around on it for you guys, talk about the bike a little bit and then we'll, and then we'll hop on and go for a ride. So this is a 100cc air-cooled two-stroke that actually has a rotary valve intake on it. So you see on this side here, in between the air box and the cylinder, there is no carburetor because it is actually under here, underneath this case. So you got your idle adjustment here, your choke, and then of course your throttle cable going down in there to, to actuate the throttle. These bikes are also oil injected, so you have a little oil tank under here, which if you pop the seat up like that, you can see the little filler next to that tiny little six volt battery. So that way back in the day, you can just pull up to the pump and pump straight gas right into it. A couple little scuffs on it, she is not mint. We got a little tear here in the seat, a couple of marks right here on the front of the tank, there as well, and then a little bit of surface stuff just on the chrome bars as well so i would eventually like to restore this bike that is on my list um i now i did before we went into storage um before i moved out west i did a couple things to it i got some new um era correct dual sport tires on it put new shoes into both the drums front and rear and i added this little chrome mirror i don't know if that's exactly what they look like on the bike but it was the the most retro looking chrome dual sporty mirror i could find that i figure looked looked right for the bike but hey that's enough talking about it let's hop on this bike and go for a ride or enough looking at it, I should say. We're gonna keep talking about it for sure. And also got this, this is a little piece of my own, a little bit of Canadian motorcycle history. If you guys remember Cycle World, these guys are down in Toronto and uh, my dad worked there back in the day. So he gave me this sweet little vintage keychain. I thought it matched the bike pretty good. So ignition on, run, make sure your gas is on because it's an old school carburetor bike. And we got the sweet kicker on there too. Oh yeah, first kick, no problem. She's a mean machine. <laughs> All 11 horsepower of it. At least that's what they say in the manual. I think uh, I think Kawasaki has been a little a little generous when they told told everybody this thing had 11 horsepower. But yeah, let's get going down here. You. Oh man. Even though this thing's a two-stroke, it is a very, very friendly power curve on this bike. No explosive power on this thing whatsoever. It's not like a KX100 of today or anything like that. No expansion chamber. Just very, very cool, calm, and collected. <laughs> Getting up those hills, no problem, eh? <laughs> Even with 10,593 kilometers. I mean, that may have been miles, cause uh, you know, I can't remember when when Canada switched over from using miles to kilometers, but I'm just gonna say it's kilometers, cause I can't verify that. <laughs> so, but still, 10,500 kilometers on a little 100cc two-stroke piston. Boy, I bet she needs a top end. <laughs> She's definitely not making 11 horsepower now. <laughs> So anyways, a couple reasons I wanted to bring this bike on the channel. Um, I mean, one, it is super, super cool. I love this bike. It's definitely one of my favorite bikes I've ever owned. It's, it's just, I love the look of it. Um, it's just, it, it reminds me so much of my old 1981 uh, Yamaha MX-80 that I grew up riding when I was younger. I mean, it looked just like this, except for with no lights and anything on it. But that style with the long seat, the twin shock, so a little bit of a uh, little bit of sentimental value in the sense of the memory for me. Um, as well, this is uh, used to be my father-in-law's bike, and he sold me this for only 350 bucks, um, which is what he paid for it. Um, so that was that's pretty cool as well having that and that's sort of like a little bit of a you know a family a family bike as well but on top of that this bike is from a very very important era in motorcycling um between from the late 60s all the way up through to the early to mid 80s i mean that was really an important time for for motorcycling and especially for dual sport riding and uh, more importantly than the 80s was the late 60s and 70s for dual sport bikes i mean when you consider that time every major japanese manufacturer honda yamaha kawasaki and suzuki they all produced 
small, reliable, affordable dual sport bikes for the masses. Um, and you know, it's because of bikes like, you know, this KE100 and Honda XLs and you know, I think, uh, what was, it? I don't think it was PEs, but uh, the name of the Suzuki one is, is, is uh, escaping me now but it's because of bikes like that and Yamaha DTs um, that so many people of the boomer generation have motorcycle stories I mean either they owned or somebody they knew owned a motorcycle or rode a motorcycle I mean it seems like everybody from that generation has a motorcycle story or you know remembers you know yeah there was that bike in the garage and something like that it just seems like everybody did and it's because of bikes like this um, that everybody was out buying them I mean like I said they were affordable they were reliable and uh, they were fun. I mean, you could pick one of these things up for like probably 350 bucks. I, I don't know what it was brand new, but I couldn't imagine this bike would have been much more than $500 back in the day. So you could have gone in the dealer for 500 bucks, pick one of these up and ride to work. And then on the way back, swinging down the dirt road or the side trail on the way home, um, which were, you know, a little more common back then, you know, dirt roads and little side trails and stuff like that. Um, especially if you were in places like Toronto, which is now very, very dense and pretty much all city. I mean, back then, I remember my dad telling me stories back in the 80s. He was, there was places that are done now just condos where he used to ride. Um, you know, so having a bike like this back then was, was pretty cool and like definitely the ticket. Um. And it all really started with Yamaha's DT1, which was released in 1978. Um, so that bike, if you don't know about it, definitely look it up. Because if you're a dirt biker or a dual sport rider, that is potentially the most important motorcycle um, ever produced. So the Yamaha DT1 came in in 1978, and it was a 250cc two-stroke air-cooled dual sport bike. Um, and really, Yamaha br brought that in because at the time, there wasn't really anybody making off-road oriented bikes. Up to that point, everybody was just building scramblers, um, you know, but taking street bikes and converting them for the dirt. Now, of course, there were a couple of European manufacturers like Husqvarna and Boltaco and uh, KTM, which were imported as Penton at the time, that were producing off-road oriented bikes that were, you know, purpose-built for off-road. But they didn't, one, they weren't as affordable as the Japanese bikes, and two, they didn't have the reliability um, that the Japanese bikes. I mean, look at this bike. Over 40 years old, and still all it needs is a quick little, you know, inspection or clean of the carb, and then second kick first kick every time like i can't even believe that i hope my my crf 300 l still going that strong in 40 years <laughs> you know what i mean um so yeah super super important bikes you know that that really really changed the game were these little dual sport bikes now another cool thing about this ke 100 is that this bike was pretty was produced all the way up to 2001 virtually unchanged um the you other than the bodywork was updated um i think in the i think in the 80s they updated it and then after that it just stayed the same but other than the bodywork and i think they updated the electronics as well on it to get a little more uh modern ignition system the bike the chassis the engine everything stayed the exact same which is really cool for me who still owns one because if i wanted to do a top end on it there are still top end kits readily available on like fortnite and rocky mountain atv that you can just order online and ship to your door um like how mint is that you know it's pretty hard to come across a retro bike that uh that you can still find parts readily available from major distributors from. I mean, of course, on my Yamaha XS, I was able to find parts for them because they're pretty big in the uh, in the flat track scene. But I had to find a Yamaha XS dedicated uh, online store. Ooh, this is a pretty steep, long hill. So this one's uh, putting a little KE to the test, eh? Oh, you're doing just fine. 40 years old, you're doing just fine climbing that. I mean, 40 years old in bike years, that's, uh, that's like me living to 100. <laughs> Even though this bike is so much smaller than modern day dual sport bikes, the ergonomics on it are crazy. I can't believe how comfortable this bike is. I mean, to look at it, you'd think, man, there's no way you'd be you'd be comfortable sitting that. You'd think you'd be so cramped in compared to a modern bike, but I mean, my arms are, are just perfectly set where they where they need to be. My knees are bent nicely, just where it needs to be to, to grab the tank. Um, now, bear in mind, I'm not the tallest guy in the world. I'm only about 5'10", 5'11", with the right shoes. <laughs> but, you know, 
for the average person, this is very, very comfortable. And another thing to keep in mind with the size of this bike, I mean, when you come to a complete stop at a, at a stoplight or something like that, you can very, very easily get both feet on the ground with a little bend in, bend in your legs. And add that to the 185 pound dry weight to this bike, unbelievably approachable unbelievably approachable and that's another thing that made these bikes so appealing to the masses is the people were like i can fit on it i can put my feet down um it's got it's lightweight i could pick it up if i drop it especially for off-road use not that these bikes were really meant for doing serious off-road stuff by today's standards but back then you know for just going around trail plong and stuff like that this bike was more than capable more than capable of doing stuff like that Another thing is the power on this bike. Like I said earlier, this thing's no, uh, it's not like a KX100 of today, but for the, kind of, for the kind of riding it was meant for and to get people into motorcycle riding and to feel comfortable on them and to, you know, get more people out, the power on this bike is very, very approachable. Very, very approachable. I mean, all these things were, were just the right steps that the Japanese made to make sure more people would buy bikes. I mean, they made the bikes affordable, the low seat height, the low weight, the reliability, you know, the uh, the approachability of the power, the way they deliver the power. I mean, all these things were, were the reason why these style of motorcycles were so popular and why they sold so many of them over the years, why all the, all the manufacturers did. I don't know what, uh, you know, why that ended. I think just, you know, once the 80s came along and, um, you know, motocross and supercross started becoming a bigger thing in north america and of course um you know the works bike started started coming up in supercross and motocross and honda kind of went that direction i think there was more of this you know this race for performance rather than approachability and getting more people on it was always i think that was a big thing that uh that arms race of motorcycles through the 80s uh, on both the dirt bike side and and the street bike side um i think that was kind of the thing that that pushed pushed you know the these bikes kind of out and uh you know we ended up with with more you know race bikes and stuff like that which is you know a good thing too i mean don't get me wrong having performance you know or enduro bikes as i know i would call them versus this is more like a dual sport even though they were marketed as enduro bikes back in the day despite their you know not really competition worthiness <laughs> they were still you know called enduro bikes i think that was kind of like people wanting more race race oriented motorcycles uh was really the uh the nail in the coffin for, the, for these types of bikes And I think Honda's introduction of, uh, you know, the CRF 250L and the CRF 230L before that, and now the CRF 300L, I think these are sort of like the rebirth, the reincarnation of these bikes and what these bikes represented. You know, it wasn't about having the fastest bike or, or anything being the upper echelon. I mean, by no means is this bike the top of the line in Kawasaki's lineup. None of their dual, spi dual sport bikes from any manufacturer were, right? Um, Except for maybe Yamaha's DT1 back in the, back in '68, but that's because that that actually came with a competition kit you could bolt on it. Um, but other than that, these bikes really weren't built around that concept. You know, they were about getting more people out on bikes and getting more people riding motorcycles. You know, I'm going to turn around here at the end of this road because this bike isn't technically um, road legal right now, so that's why I'm keeping it on this uh, on this little back road here. So we're gonna, we're gonna turn around and finish this video heading back the other way. But yeah, like I said, I think I think these uh, you know these modern dual sport bikes like the 300L, like the 250L, and uh, you know Kawasaki's KLX 300 and 250, um, them included. I think they're sort of like the reincarnation. Oh, hit the horn there. I think. I think those bikes are sort of like the the new version of this. Again, not about performance necessarily. Not not trying to be the fastest or the or the most advanced technology in them, but they're about getting people out riding, get more people introduced to motorcycling. Um, now, of course, the 300 from Honda and the 250L and Kawasaki's 300. Of course, those bikes are far more capable than this bike is. Um, whether whether it be on the road or off road, I mean that's just because technology's gone 
front better and I mean those bikes are more capable off-road really than motocross bikes were when this thing came out <laughs> um, but I think in comparison to you know what was available on the market when when the KE was released and what's available on the market now um, as far as competition bikes were concerned I think they fall fairly well into that same category I mean in 1978 most um i mean 78's probably pushing it but this bike was originally released in 1974 and if you go back to 1974 i mean motocross bikes didn't look that much different they had long tanks like this they had you know short wide seats like this one did as well they were also twin shock at the rear um so it was using relatively similar technology i mean definitely dialed down I mean, you look at the, you know, the, the, the CRF 300 or 250L and the Kawasaki KLX, I mean, they do have inverted forks and they have monoshock rear suspension, liquid cool, double overhead cam. You know, these are all the same, you know, things you'll see written down about competition bikes, just at, just at a different level and a different price point. But comparatively, very, very similar in the concept, right? And I'm happy to see those bikes coming back. I'm happy to see this resurgence in, uh, you know, these little dual sport bikes trying to get, you know, new riders into the sport. Um, and I almost like to see more of it. Like, I like to see a more entry-level bike than just the uh, CRF 300 from Honda. Um, you know, something with a little shorter seat height, um, maybe, maybe something air-cooled with a little less, you know, that's less prone if you do drop it to crush a rat or something like that something for truly entry-level riders like maybe even take their little crf 125 platform that they have now that has some fuel injection but is air-cooled and does have a little have a slightly shorter um seat height and is lighter because it is air cooled and it's a more simple engine It'd be nice to even see that come about as a as a very a true true entry level dual sport bike you know um because i think with more bikes like that and more bikes that are based off this concept of the ke and the dt and uh you know the uh, little honda xls and the i think it was called an sl was honda's little 100 cc dual sport bike that was very similar to the xr 100 engine that would that would kept going all the way up to 2004 i think think it did um, but I think we need more bikes like that you know um, along those same lines to kind of get more people into it because I think it'd be a great thing if in, in 20 years from now again you could talk to everybody and everybody would have a motorcycle story you know everybody would have that story like oh yeah I remember you know my brother had that in the you know that Honda CRF in the corner or yeah my sister bought a little Kawasaki KLX you know the 125 dual sport bike and she rode that thing everywhere like that would be awesome to see that happen again I think the key to doing that today is the same way they did it back in the 70s back when there was this lull in the motorcycle industry and they needed a game changer to do it and Yamaha started that with the DT1 and we could do it all over again you know I think we're at a great spot for it you know people are looking to get out more I mean after COVID everybody was looking for ways to get out get out more and do new things and try new things and I think we're at a moment right now where we could really get another big boom in the industry and I think all it would take it was just manufacturers producing really small entry level dual sport bikes i think we're doing a great job where we're at now i mean ktm has that 390 adventure um honda again like i have the 300 yamaha unfortunately kind of got out of it i don't not sure if they didn't see there was a big market for it but as far as i can tell honda and cali are selling out of every 300 dual sport bike they can produce um so it'd be nice to see yamaha get back in the game with something you know whether it be another 300 or maybe they can be the first ones like like back in 68 maybe be the first ones to come out with a 125 you know little dual sport bike for true true entry level riders you know what i mean i think that'd be i think it'd be really really cool i think there is a market for people not looking to always jump on the highway just to do true local exploring you know like this bike was able to do 80 kilometers an hour just 11 horsepower I mean, yes it only weighs 185 pounds but i think you get you know uh, a crf 125l to do you know 80 kilometers an hour which is plenty for doing secondary highways all right i think this is as good a place as any i'm gonna turn this guy around here There she is, 1978 KE100. What a great little bike. 
So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you enjoyed taking a ride on my retro dual sport bike. Let me know in the comments. What do you guys think? Do you think do you think we need a resurgence of these really, really small, you know, around town exploring machines? Like I don't get me wrong. Like I, I love my three hundred. Like I like I just mentioned there, you know, like I feel like a, a bit of like a uh, you know, a broken record, but you know, I like my, my 300. I like the Kawasaki 300 as well. But, you know, I still see people look at them and like, wow, that's awfully tall. And, man, that is heavy. And, yes, that that is true. They do have a taller seat height these days, um, you know, for more ground clearance and more suspension travel. I mean, all that all comes with a taller seat height. It's pretty, you know, it's difficult unless you build like a like a trials bike frame where it just completely dips away to, to get that extra ground clearance without, without, raising, without raising the seat height as well. But let me know, do you think there's a market for little bikes like this? You know, people feel more confident on it. They can put both feet on the ground. They can, you know, if they drop it, they don't have to be worried about not being able to pick it up. You know, maybe we can have another boom in motorcycling today that we had in the 70s and maybe everybody will have another motorcycle story right on guys that's it for today i hope you enjoyed the video don't forget to like and subscribe and hit that bell so when i release new videos you get a notification and uh we'll catch you in the next one peace